Good morning. I want to welcome everyone and encourage you all to put a sweater on. This is, I, I always, I thought, you know, why is it Portland is always supposed to have cold and rainy weather and it's beautiful outside and it's warm and in here, it looks, it, it seems like they're trying to reproduce uh, the conditions or something. It, it is a bit, it is a bit cool. Well, I'm Bernard Goldberg. You know, he talked a lot about how organizations have moved from the if to the how. And that's what this session is about, is really how do you make your organization open source ready. And so over the next hour, what I want to talk about is the kinds of things that you might think about as you move forward with open source, the kinds of choices that you need to make, maybe the kind of challenges that you'll face as you go forward with that, and offer some uh, ideas and some guidance and some things that you can put into place as you move forward with making open source kind of a, a standardized part of the way you do things as opposed to the skunk works way that maybe many of you have seen open source happen in your organizations. And what I'd like to say is, uh, you know, I'd like to encourage questions while, we're, while, this, uh, while I'm going through the presentation. I think that makes for a much more uh, lively and a much more interesting uh, presentation, a lot more engaging. So please, you know, if something's not clear, if you have a question or, or if you think that's a really uh, dumb idea, don't be afraid. Well, on the ladder, don't put your hand up, but all the rest of them, put your hand up and ask. And that'd be great. Would you, would you please kind of adjust the microphone to point more directly at your mouth? And is, is this better? Raise it up a little bit. Is this better? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Is, is that better? Yeah. Okay, great. If that's better, that's good. So what I want to talk to you today is a little bit is an introduction. I'll tell you about, a little bit about myself. An overview of open source best practices. This organizational, making your organization ready, falls into an overall over open source best practices that we talk about with um, organizations and so forth. And I want to see, show you where it kind of falls into that process. Outline the key differences between open source and commercial software. And they're very significant and very profound. A lot of folks think, well, open source, commercial software, it's all software, it's all the same stuff. You know, we use the same uh, kinds of formats and same processes. That's not really the case. Talk about the implications of open source usage. And then look at uh, some key uh, things to put in place, which are license and usage policy, as well as an architecture and product policy. Talk about implementing an open source program office as a place to a locus of expertise and a place where you kind of make decisions. We'll uh, sort of circle back through the open source best practices. Then set a set of action items. You know, what should you take away to go back to your organizations with and say, this is what my punch list is. These are the things I need to think about. And then we can talk uh, additional questions. So just to tell you about me, I'm the CEO of uh, Navica, which is an open source strategy consulting firm. And we work with members of the open source ecosystem. By that I mean end users, vendors, service providers. People, all organizations that sort of say, this open source is a new phenomenon. What do we do with it? How does it affect what we do? What changes should we make? I'm the author of Succeeding with Open Source, which is a book focused on really the strategic use of open source and evaluating open source products to figure out if they're uh, right for your organization. And I'll touch on uh, something that's contained in that book in I think uh, maybe the next slide. And I uh, also do a regular blog for CIO Magazine called The Open Source, where there's kind of commentary on what's going on with open source from an enterprise type perspective. In terms of open source best practices, where this sits, basically we break it into three different areas, organization, process, and community. Community being the collaboration kind of stuff. In terms of the organization, that's what we're going to talk about today, so I don't want to dwell on it a lot here, but basically we're going to talk about the differences between open source and commercial software, license uh, and usage policy, architecture and product policy, and open source program office. In terms of process, this is sort of the in the day-to-day. -day. Once you've got the foundation set, in other words, you've got your policy set, you've got your open source program office up and running, what do you do with individual projects as you move forward? How are the what are the things that you have to put into place with your overall project management process? And one is the open source maturity model, which is, as I uh, uh, noted, that's something that's described in the Succeeding with Open Source book. It's basically a way to evaluate and assess open source products, to make the right choice for an open source product as you decide to go that direction for some individual project. 
So just as an example, how would you go about selecting the right open source content management system from the 25 that are out there? So the open source maturity model is a way to assess those products, uh, evaluate them against your rec uh, requirements, and figure out what the right choice is. Code management is a key issue with open source. We're going to be talking a little bit about the differences between open source and commercial software. But one of the key differences is you, it, you don't sort of get an official release from a vendor in the sense that you can download it. And then somebody in the next cubicle can download the next version. And the next version, you know, something else. And you can very easily end up in a situation where you've got eight different versions of a product running within your infrastructure. And as you can imagine, that causes, the light is great, but anything you can do on the heat front? <laughs> um, as you can imagine, that can cause real challenges because you may find bugs running in one machine that you don't find another. And somebody will say, well, it must be an anomaly. Well, it might be the fact that there's different versions running. So code management can become more of an issue in this world. Project management, you know, um, within the, within the uh, I'll talk about it, I guess, in the next slide, but one of the things that comes up around the open source world that's different than the commercial world is, in the commercial world, typically you have a relationship with a vendor, right? And the vendor kind of, um, dis, you know, sort of presents you with an entire bundle. This is the product, this is how the training program, and really you're managing the vendor. Well, in the open source world, it's much more collaborative, and really you, there tend to be a lot more players. In other words, you might go into an outside training pro, uh, provider. You might be looking for somebody to provide services for you. And it's kind of a, a, a more of a lazy fair world. In terms of project management, that's a challenge because you're no longer coordinating with just one entity. You may be managing five or six different entities to put together that entire bundle for your stuff. So that's project management. And then project ROI, I put a lot of emphasis on this. Many people think about open source, well, it's, it, you know, it, it, there's no license fees, so it must have incredible ROI. Other people say, well, I can't really figure it out. And some other folks say, well, you don't kind of, open source is kind of free and easy, so it shouldn't have TCO ROI type analyses. And I think that's really wrong. And so we have a whole format about how you go about um, looking at that. And just as a side note on that, if you're interested more in the open source ROI stuff, <clears throat> I did a, I did a, webcast with a company called OpenLogic about uh, oh, a week or so ago about open source ROI. And that's up there and stored, so you can go take a look at it. It's just openlogic.com, and you can find your way into their, uh, web, their webinars and uh, take a look at the recording of that. And then community is really all about, you know, how do you take advantage and, and also contribute to this world where you're collaborating? You know, this collaboration becomes a much bigger deal, and it's a very different world. You know, probably within commercial software, most of us are used to, I have some issue, I call the vendor. And in this world, oftentimes, there is no vendor. And so it's, there's nobody, you know, I always hear about one throat to choke, but there isn't some central place of wisdom. And so you have to figure out, how do I take advantage of that community? How do I join it? How do I contribute to it? And so joining the community is you know, basically collaboration 101. How do I participate? How do I contribute? How do I take advantage of it? Supporting is you know, when you start taking on some of the burden. And in this collaborative environment that Stuart was outlining, you start actually you know, supporting it in some fashion. You may hire someone who is part of a project. How do, you, how do you go about that? How do you deal with the intellectual property issues around that and so forth? And then contributing is really where you start doing some heavy lifting and maybe are taking some of your stuff and really putting it into the community very heavily. And this is where you become a central part and a lot of skills around that. So community is the third piece. This is an overview of open source best practices in terms of an organizational approach across all the dimensions. What we're going to focus on now is the organizational aspects. How do you make your organization open source ready? Let's, let's talk first about the key differences between commercial and open source software because these underpin why you might need to do something different with your organization. And if you look at commercial software, traditionally it's been delivered with a very restrictive license, right? Here's the product. You can put this many users on it. You can put it on this class of machine with this many processors. You know, and you can use it in these conditions. 
it, by contrast, open source comes with a very expansive license. It basically says, here's the product. Download it. Figure out if it's right for you. You can use it any way you want. Put it on as many machines as you want. You can have as many users as you want. If your business conditions change and you need to use more of it, no problem. Just put it on, just slap it onto some more machines. It's all under your control. It's a very expansive license. And by the way, if you need to change it a little bit to work better for your organization, go ahead. The source code's available. You can make the changes and you can even contribute them back. So it's a very expansive license. Coming out of that though, on the commercial side, the vendor charges you a lot of money for those licenses, right? I mean, that's a typical thing. And based on that, they then create a bundled offering. They then create the whole soup to nuts around the product. You have to go to them for support. They're the people who make decisions about when functionality goes in and gets delivered. They will typically take the responsibility for writing all the documentation, creating the training programs you send your people to. They will have a certified service provider program with you know, the whole certification processes. And so really, as a customer, you can be relatively passive. They do all the work of creating all of that bundle. And really, what you do is typically something along the lines of, you know, let me do a beauty contest. Let me figure out who the right vendor is. Let me put together an RFP and let them do all the work to respond to it. So the key challenge, of course, is always selecting the right vendor, right? Because once you make the choice, once you sign the agreement, kind of all the power in the relationship shifts. And all of a sudden, you're on their schedule for when releases will get done and so forth. So that's the commercial world. The open source world is very different. Because there's no license fees associated with them, because you're not making a large investment up front, really, the entities that de de develop and deliver that product have much less revenue stream to do that, to create that entire bundle. And so in this world, it's a much more decentralized kind of collaborative world. And so as a customer, Really, you have to be much more active. You have to go out and seek all those resources and figure out a way to put them together and create the coalition of, of, the, of the providers that will give you what you need. So you have a, you're much more active, and the vendor or project is much more passive. And just to give you an example of this, and I know there's a procurement panel uh, a little bit later today. And uh, this is an example that actually one of the members of the audience uh, had. Uh, they were looking at putting in, considering putting in an open source solution and uh, for an ERP system. They had an aging ERP system. They said, we're very enthusiastic about open source. We'd like to do it. We put together this entire RFI with, you know, 300 questions. You know, how do you do this? How do you do that? Very standard kind of thing, right? They said, we'd like to understand how the open source alternative would do with that. You know, could you talk with them and help, you know, get that done? So I said, okay. I took this 300 question RFI to this open source company and said, you know, we'd like to fill it out. And by the way, this is like a $10 million project, right? A huge, very large project. And as most of you know, if you dangled a $10 million project in front of a commercial vendor, you'd have to pry them off your ankle, right? I mean, they'd be on you day and night. How can we answer this? What can we do? How about a chalk talk? Hey, have you got, hey, there's a great golf course, it's whatever it might be. They would move heaven and earth to respond to this thing, right? What this open source company said, well, that's a very interesting RFI. How much is it worth to the entity to find out all that information? We'll take that on as a service project, right? In other words, it'll be a for fee service to tell them how well we, the product will do that. I mean, that's a completely different world. And so this tells you that the customer has to take a more active role. And so, you know, the key challenge in this world is creating the mature product is really figuring out how do you put the products together. And so kind of as a, as a entree into this whole open source best practices, recognize that you're probably going to be taking on a more active role and you need to think about that. The implications of open source usage. So I've talked a lot about these kind of different challenges, right? So, or different conditions. You're not in a position where you're going to be sending out an RFP after you do a tremendous amount of work and getting a vendor to reply. And, the, you know, and then eventually you'll go through the procurement process. And at some point in that, code will eventually show up on a CD or you'll, something like that. And then you can begin working with it. With open source, basically, software can appear in your organization and infrastructure via an anonymous download. What that means is someone sitting in a cubicle somewhere 
can click a button and you can have a product up and running in your organization without ever going through your official processes. And so the things that you think about as the way you get software can be very different in this world. And so what you expect as typical procurement processes may be inappropriate for this world. And I just gave you an example. The RFP may be a key part of your procurement process. And it's hard when the other party doesn't want to play. So you need to think about developing new approaches that achieve the open source benefits while mitigating those challenges. And just to outline kind of some of the challenges, if someone's doing a download, you can end up in a situation where you can have four different content management systems running in your, in your organization. And they're all up and running. And we'll talk a little bit further about the kinds of things that happen with that. But the, intuitively, you can understand that, that would be a problem. You know, just like having four different databases running can cause problems for your organization. So the first step is oftentimes is creating a license and use, usage policy. So one question might be, is it necessary? And in some respects, for most of the people in this audience, you might think, well, it, it really isn't. Because the, people, the things that people are most afraid of with open source licenses typically don't apply to end users, people who do not plan to distribute open source software. Because you bring it in, you use it, you're not, you can use it without any conditions. You don't have to report back to anybody. You don't have to tell them how much you're using and so forth. And even if you make changes, you are not obligated to redistribute those changes. You do not have to give them back. You can keep them completely within your organization. So in a sense, most open source licenses do not impose conditions that you, on the face of it, have to really sort through it. It's nowhere near the same as with commercial software vendors who have to be very, very careful about the implications of the open source licenses they use. I mean, you know, because if they do it wrong, basically, in a way, their, their businesses can vaporize. So you might not think that it's necessary, but in a sense, it's an important thing to look at, and particularly on the usage side. I will say that with the upcoming revision of the GPL license, GPL3, that may have some implications about open source usage even within end user organizations. And you know, it's in the uh, review process right now, and it's supposed to be issued uh, maybe January of next year. But you know, I would encourage all of you to understand the implications of GPL3 when it comes out. So just something to, as a heads up. And that will make it more likely that organizations will have to put in a place a formal license policy. So looking at the you know, licenses, organizations oftentimes try and figure out you know, what are the right licenses to use. And there's a challenge with license proliferation. Because many of you have probably heard of GPL or maybe the Mozilla license or something like that. The open source, the OSI, which is the open source dot, dot org, I think. I think it's open source.org. Pardon me? Open source initiative. The open source initiative, which is open source.org, is a kind of a, a place where a, they approve open source licenses according to the, there's a certain set of conditions that open source has to follow, a product has to follow to be open source. If you go to opensource.org, they, they have the conditions there. In fact, they have a, doc, a PDF that you can download. They've approved about 60 some licenses. So obviously, you know, for example, um, the academic licenses like the Berkeley license are approved by them and so forth. Interestingly, the GPL license is not approved by them. I think. Or they may have approved it, but the Free Software Foundation says, we don't care if you approved it. But there's about 60. And some of them are special purpose licenses. So for example, there are company-specific open source licenses. This does not exhaust the world of open source licenses. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of open source licenses beyond the approved ones. And uh, you know, they, they go as far as things like the free beer license, where a, where a guy who wrote some software, that's pretty good software, distributed it and said, it's your free your, to use it and everything like that, but if you ever meet me, you have to buy me a beer. <laughs> and it's humorous, but that's the license it's under. So a lot of organizations sort of say, well, you know, we're not comfortable with trying to keep track of 50 or 60 different licenses, not to mention all these other ones. 
we're going to look, go through this and figure out what the right licenses are for us. And if we're going to accept the product into our infrastructure, it has to have, it has to fall into these, you know, whatever it is, five or ten or fifteen approved licenses. And so that's something to really keep in mind, you know, so that that's the first cut. You know, are we looking, willing to look at a product? Does it have, you know, an, is it fall under these approved licenses? Now, what I would recommend is, when you start doing that, is look at what you've already got running and figure out what those licenses are. Because, of course, one truth of IT is that no one ever wants to take out a system that's in and running. So you want to see what you've got. Because uh, you probably don't want to be in a position where you, uh, your first, your first uh, outcome of your license policy is that you outlaw something you've already got in and running. So take a look at that. But also take a look at what you are likely to, what things are on the horizon that you're like wanting to do, that you're likely to do, and see what licenses are there. Because those are the licenses that are likely to come into your portfolio that you ought to think about, do those make sense for you to um, put into your uh, approved license. And the right audience for this is, should include legal, but not be limited to legal. Uh, I don't know you know, how all of your attorneys are, but in many companies, attorneys are people who don't get to say no often enough at home, so they like to do it at work a lot. And so, if you just look to them for advice about these licenses, you're likely to get a very, very uh, restrictive approach that will impinge on, you know, your, your business or your uh, organizational objectives. So, you need to incorporate legal advice, but that's not the only advice here. And really it makes sense to inc include development or what you might call the people who are looking at putting in systems, operations, the people who run them, and also of course management. So coming out of this, you know, in terms of licensing and, and usage policies, um, you know, of course what you have to do is put that together. It's a collaborative effort to put it together, and then you have to document it. But the key is communicating it, and communicating it in a way that makes it, you know, um, uh, user friendly. So not kind of like, okay, I'm from, I'm, you know, I'm here to tell you what you have to do, but here's what we've developed, you know, and we'd like to do that. And it makes sense to, you know, one of the things about keeping, uh, including developers and in operations is you incorporate thought leaders, people who have influence within the organization, who are seen as peers by people, and if they've put their stamp of approval on it, then people feel more comfortable about it. They don't feel like it's something imposed from outside or above or something like that. Education is key. I mean, once you develop the, the policy, it's got to be known to everyone. And so obviously, initial hire orientation it should be part of the package for your technical staff, right? Blah, 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 here's the way we do this, here's the way we do this, here's how we handle open source. And here's how are you know, the uh, conditions under which we use open source. But it's not enough to do it just at the time the person shows up for work. So, you know, you have to figure out a way to reinforce this on an ongoing basis. So, you know, at some staff meetings, once a year, twice a year, something like that, have an opportunity to have a module around this so that you just reinforce it. So everyone gets an opportunity to have this brought home. And of course, if, if, as you modify it on an ongoing basis, because you should review it, you would need to communicate any changes as well. So for example, if you've got one already, and then on the basis of the GPL3, you say, okay, we need to think, you know, rethink this and modify it, obviously you're gonna to wanna to come back and communicate that through the whole organization. Any questions so far? I've GPL stand for? GPL uh, originally stood for the GNU public license and now stands for the general public license. And it is, basically the brainchild of a fellow named Richard Stallman, who is kind of the godfather of, uh, of the free software movement. He is, uh, it's, it's associated with the Free Software Foundation, which is a, uh, an organization devoted to free software. And that's free as in speech, not as in beer. So meaning that it's kind of around liberty, not around just the fact that it's cheap. And uh, you know, uh, many of you may know this, or some of you may know this, but uh, just as a kind of background. So there's a kind of a two threads within the whole open source zeitgeist or movement. One is a sort of associated with the Free Software Foundation, which is a very, you know, ideological or 
you know, idealistic approach to it, which says, basically says there should be no such thing as intellectual property. All intellectual property should be shared. It should be absolutely free for anyone to use. And in terms of software, that means all software should be free for use. There should be no conditions, no restrictions. O open source takes a different perspective, and depending on kind of where you are in that, in that spectrum of, of opinion around open source, some people al align very closely with Free Software Foundation, but it all goes all the way to, we create a great product, we want to see the whole world use them, and if somebody takes it and incorporates it into a commercial product, well, that's okay because more people are using it. So it's a less ideological perspective and more about pragmatic. You know, it's just a great way to create uh, software. It's a great way to enable more people to use it. And you know, uh, that's, an, that's a second approach. Um, maybe this is more than you need to know. But anyway, so that's, that there's a bit of uh, two threads within that. There's a very strong ideological perspective around free software and around GPL. And that's a lot of what's driving this update to the GPL for GPL3. And that's, you know, basically they're going back to the license and saying, all these clever people have figured out a way to take GPL software and do things around it that doesn't really fit the way we want to do things. Let's improve the license so they can't do that anymore. And that's likely to have implications for other kinds of organizations, including your own. So that's why I suggest you take a look at it. Other questions? All right. Now, an architecture and product policy. This is very important. Many people who talk about open source say, okay, well, we've dealt with the legal, the license stuff, the usage, meaning who can download it, you know, under what conditions, we're done. To my mind, this only gets half the battle because the reality of most organizations is not only do you have a lot of software in there, but you've got to have it work with all the software you've got. And you've got architectural approaches and architectural plans and frameworks that anything that you bring in should be consistent with. And this is a real challenge because remember, you may have your overall you know, five-year roadmap, this is our architecture, this is how we do things, but if somebody in a cubicle says, you know, I think this is a really cool product, I'm gonna download it and put this system in, all of a sudden you've got something that may or may not be consistent with your ongoing uh, vision. And so an architecture and product policy is kind of the flip side or the companion to the license policy. You've got to make sure that, you know, well, I would say you, you should make sure that whatever you bring in in terms of open source is consistent with the way you're going to do things for your overall infrastructure. You know, obviously you identify your existing and ideal infrastructure, architecture and infrastructure. Most organizations do not have the luxury of having a perfect infrastructure. Most organizations have a lot of what they've had for a long time and they've accreted new things around it and so forth. But also, most organizations are also trying to figure out a way, how do I rationalize that? You know, going forward, how do I get more consistency? You know, how do I do that in a way that's going to maybe reduce my overall cost structure in maintaining all of this? And so having an existing and ideal gives you a, a, a way to slot the things that you bring in that are open source into that. So, in terms of new products that you're going to bring in, you know, define what qualities or characteristics that you want them to have. So, are they in an implementation language that is consistent with what languages you want to use within your organization? You know, a classic here is Java versus, you know, scripting languages. And when does it make sense and so forth. If you put a huge amount of uh, effort into becoming a Java shop and then someone brings in a content management system that's built on PHP, you now have the challenge of continuing forward with two skill sets. So, you know, implementation language is one thing. The integration mechanisms, you know, uh, this is around how am I going to get this to work with the rest of my organization, or with the rest of my infrastructure. If I've got a specified way that I want to go about this, are the new products capable of supporting that? So, how many people here are starting to move toward SOA type stuff? Just a few. You know, that is, in a way, that's sort of the coming trend within the, within the IT industry. And, and it's a good way, it's a good thing because it's a standardized method of uh, doing integrations. It gives you good, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for in my head here? You know, it gives you a way to not have these things tightly coupled. It gives you a loosely coupled approach to integration, which is very good. And it, what is SOA? SOA is service-oriented architecture. 
which is basically um, front-ending applications with a standards-based way, way of doing integration. So you, it's a, almost like an RPC type mechanism, a remote procedure call. It's all done with XML, so it uses a standards based doing that. It typically uses XML as the payload, in other words, the, the delivery mechanism for the, for the data, which is very good because it gives you, um, you're not locked into a binary format, which is very difficult to figure out what's going on. And, and also, you know, it doesn't bind you into, a, into basically a vendor. You have a lot more flexibility around it. And a big push toward that is, is a way for people to keep legacy systems in and running, which is, of course, I said everyone wants to do, but put a way for them to be integrated with the rest of the stuff that's in there, rather than trying to do the old, you know, hand-wired, hard-coded hard kinds of approaches. So if that's your chosen mechanism, you want to make sure that the new products you bring in support that. Because if they come in and they say, well, the only way that you can get data in and out of this thing is comma-separated values, you, you know, that's not consistent with the way you want to go forward. And that may not be as flexible as you need. So look at integration. Because one truth of all software is it, it never comes in and operates alone. It comes in, it operates, and you have to tie it into other systems. And then inevitably, you need to tie it into more systems. So you want to do that. And management mechanism in terms of, you know, how do you interact with it? How do you manage the product? Is, is it capable of being plugged into a commercial or an open source uh, systems management product as well? You know, that's something you want to look at because that's a key way that you run your systems as well. Defining this overall architecture, uh, you know, enables wise product selection during the process phase. So I mentioned that open source maturity model. A key part of that is what are my requirements? And part of those requirements are, you know, what kinds of architecture, what kinds of language, what kinds of things does it, does it need to support? And so this feeds directly into that product selection process. These last three bullet points really fall out of a, they're, they're not in the technical perspective, they're into the organizational perspective. And to the, to the extent that you bring in new products that are consistent with your um, existing infrastructure, your existing architectural choices, that's a good thing. And this is true whether it's commercial or open source, but in the context of open source, because of the challenges of making that product selection, you know, it's important to have this defined and communicated because you're not going through that traditional procurement process where part of what you'd be doing in your 130 question RFI is, you know, what is your integration mechanism to describe it in detail or whatever. So in terms of organizational stuff, what this means is as you bring in new products that are consistent with this architecture and product policy, you're going to get better skill amortization. You're going to have people who can work on more systems. You're going to raise the organizational effectiveness because essentially you're not going to have you know, uh, uh, systems that people aren't really sure about. You'll be able to cross-train and so forth. So it's going to make your organization more effective around running these things and probably reduce your cost structure as well. So from, from a management perspective, putting in an architecture and product policy helps you because it's going to make sure that the new products you bring in that are open source are consistent with that. So it has goodness around things like your budget and so forth. From the human capital side or from the employee's perspective, this is also very good because to the extent that you have better cross-training, you are able to do things like provide you know, uh, people with better career paths or give them an opportunity to work on new interesting things so they don't remain stuck. I can't tell you how many times in the past I've interviewed somebody for a job and of course, one of the questions is, well, why do you want to leave where you are? And they'll say something like, I'm the only one who knows how to use this system. I've been stuck on it for three years, and I'm looking at another 10 years. And I don't want to do that for the rest of my career. Or I don't want to do that. Or I want to develop new skills. And so having, ha choosing products that are consistent with the way you, your overall uh, architecture can reduce that employee dissatisfaction and reduce your employee turnover. So that's, that's a kind of a, a good thing in general. And so that's a fallout of creating an architecture and product policy around your open source choices. And of course, it reduces the ever fearful risk of 
We have no idea how it works. It's in and running, and we hope it, nothing ever goes wrong with it. Because, you know, I, how many of you have those kinds of systems? You know, it's been chosen, it's been put in, or maybe worse, from your perspective, one person knows how to, how to run it, and basically, you've got to suck up to that person and hope they never leave. So, making wise selections that are consistent with your uh, policies reduce your, your risk of having islands of functionality that you're, you're sort of stuck with. And of course, you know, that also makes it easier to get them integrated and so forth and so on. So this is kind of the architecture and product policy around open source. So that when you make your product selections within open source, you say, Does this, is this consistent with the way we want to do things? It seems it seems like it's maybe warmed up a little bit in here. Is that is that consistent with everyone else's? Or maybe I'm just talking. I'm getting warmer. <coughs> an open source program office. What well, what is this? Well, first off, it's not always called an open source program office. Depending on where it is, it's called different things. It might be called an open source program office. It might be called an open source policy center. It might be called you know an open source uh, center of of excellence. Whatever it might be. What it is, is it's, a, it's an organizational integration mechanism for the license and architecture policy. And depending on how the organization decides to set it up, it can either be an actual you know, kind of physical group. We have three people in our open source program office, or it can be a virtual. We have three people who part of their time is spent, and it might be five, I'm not saying three is the right number, who spend part of their time doing this work in, a, you know, in addition to their regular activities. And for one thing, what this does is it provides, an op it provides a way for kind of a coffee shop plaza effect, meaning this is where everybody sort of goes to to talk about open source and what they're doing about open source or to ask questions. So it's kind of a, a center of knowledge. So it's a good thing that, you know, I'm thinking about doing this open source thing. What about this? Let me go talk to the people at the program office. And you say, blah, 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 blah. And they say, oh, you know, that's really interesting because you know, this other project over here is thinking about doing that, and they're looking at this product. Have you considered that? So it's a, it's a kind of a train switching, round table kind of thing for, for knowledge and information sharing. So it's a, it's a very effective around that. It increases your organizational learning because it's a locus. You know, people there get very acquainted with what's going on throughout the entire organization and can share information. Now, it can be integrated into your existing IT processes. So how many of you uh, have an organization in your, uh, a group or a task force or whatever you might call it in your organization that does something like, you know, project review boards or something like that, where basically projects, as they're kicked off and through milestones, meets with them? How many? Can I see some hands? Okay, probably a third at least. Well, you can integrate the open source piece into that and have that just be another piece of what goes on there. And um, for example, Wells Fargo does that. Now in terms of an open source program office, companies like HP have that. So you know, if you're doing something around open source in HP, you'll inevitably find your way through that organization. And it is a separate organization. Within Wells Fargo, they have what they call an AAA organization, which is, uh, I think, architecture and approval are two of the A's. But basically, that is a, an organization, that is a uh, function, and I think it's not staffed permanently. So it's basically people who are sort of um, CTOs of groups or um, you know, lead architects or something like that come together. And for any project, it goes, before the, it goes through the AAA during its life a number of times. So at project inception, here's our idea, here's our concept, here's what we want to do. At the time of making product selections, it goes through there. At the time of you know, development completion. And at each point, it goes through there and explains what the status of the project is, what the challenges are, and so forth, and gets a kind of a you know, uh, thumbs up, thumbs down, or thumbs sideways, go do some work and come back. As part of that, within Wells Fargo, they also do the open source piece. The open source piece is, is in there. And what they do there is within Wells Fargo, they will have an approved product list. And how many of you use approved product lists? Kind of, you know, if you're going to do a database, you've got to use this database. Anyone? A couple. Well, you know, it's very common. Well, within Wells Fargo, they have basically a list of 
approved commercial and approved open source alternatives within every category. And if you are a project and you're making a selection, you're expected to choose one from that menu. And so, you know, if you want to go off of that, you have to basically have a pretty good argument for it, and you're expected to do that. And what they do then also within that is they will say this is the approved version to be used of these products. And so if you're a uh, project, basically you have to go through that one. You can't sort of typically say, well, we want to use this later version. You know, we'll do that. Because they're trying to avoid that question, that issue of version proliferation. Now, some organizations take it even further. Sabre Holdings, which is uh, uh, the parent of Travelocity. Maybe, maybe many of you have used Travelocity. Well, if you've noticed anything about the travel industry, it is uh, hurting financially. And so the way they approach these things is when they do an approved list of products and put an open source ver product into that list, that becomes the default choice for that type of product for any project within Sabre. So once they approve an open source alternative for, let's say, a database, it's on that list. And if you're a project, you're expected to go before that board and you know, say, yeah, we're using that database, that open source database. And if you want to, say, use a commercial product, you basically have to make a darn good argument for them because they are very, very cost conscious. So that's, that's the kind of thing that goes on in these program offices or these approval processes. The open source program office is much more effective as a carrot rather than a stick. So what I mean by that is, is people in your organization are putting together projects. It's much better if they see this organization as someone who will help them do their job more easily as opposed to, oh, those are the people we have to go before who always beat us up about things. And, you know, you really have to, I think, you know, this is an organizational type issue, a management type issue, a personal type thing, but you have to be very careful about this. Because the, the thing about this, uh, about this open source world, remember, it's, it's not that hard to bypass this. In the commercial world, Everybody had to go through the process because you had to go through the procurement office or whatever it was to sign off on it. So they had to. They couldn't get the software. In the open source world, if they're not feeling like they're getting what they want from this organization, they just won't show up. They'll just download it and do their project. So this has to be a place that really helps, is seen as helping people and as you know, a place of learning and a place where they can get advice. It's more effective as a project milestone review rather than a one-time event. So rather than a, we go before them when we are putting our project plan together and say this is what we're going to do, it's better to have this, this office have an ongoing contact with projects and particularly around milestones because that's the natural place. How do you stand with this? What are challenges have you run into? And so forth. And this office can also be the delivery mechanism for the license and architecture uh, policy stuff. So this is a natural place to have someone who has expertise around those things where you, you know, as you do your new hire orientation, someone from that group comes and gives the, you know, half hour or hour lecture uh, overview of that policy at that time. So this is a natural place for that to come out of and for that expertise to be located. Uh, you know, in terms of, you know, how you communicate this and so forth, I've talked about, you know, kind of delivering it, but it, it also makes sense to have, you know, this organization associated with a intranet or a wiki or something like that where basically your policy is up for everyone to see that they can look at it at any time. Any questions about the program office? All right, so basically what, what uh, I've just gone through here now is this, you know, in terms of over, open source best practices, we've really gone down the organizational track and really talked about the things to put into place with your uh, organizational you know, how around open source. This is, sets the foundation for the rest of what you'll do. And then obviously you move on to process and then you have to figure out how to collaborate with the community as well. So this isn't um, the end of what you do with open source. This just sets the foundation for being organizationally effective with it. So what should you do, what, what should you leave today or tomorrow, I guess, from the conference and think about with your open source organizational stuff. First, understand those key differences. It's a different world and be ready to understand and grapple with that different world. And I you know, talked about that RFP process, but you know, be ready to 
understand that you are going to have to adjust your procurement processes and probably take a more active role within the open source stuff. You know, so you know, recognize that you're going to have to modify your process and so forth. Examine your license policy in light of your organizational requirements. I mean, it makes sense to evaluate what licenses your you know, conditions you want, which ones you'll approve, and to you know identify those and make sure that those are explicit. And extend that to your architecture and products so that you get the best possible use of open source, so that you don't end up with stranded islands of functionality with one person who knows how to run it, and you know. Hopefully that person will never retire, or at least while, as long as you're in the organization. And then look at it, creating a center of excellence and energy with the open source program office. You know, really start to do this. And you know, in terms of a, a way to accomplish this, probably each one of you, I mean those of you who are managers, and I assume some of you are because I see ties, you've probably already got people in your organization who are enthusiastic about open source. who you know, are doing a lot of it at home, you know, who are running that. Those are natural candidates to have, be involved with this open source program office. They're natural candidates to have, be evangelists for these kinds of things. And they are great people to have, a, uh, you know, that you bring into the fold because they're going to be people who effectively advocate for this and, you know, will be seen as thought leaders around open source and get the rest of the organization comfortable with it. So, you know, really, Look out within your organization. Say, who are the people that are really, you know, open source savvy and doing that? And in terms of additional questions, uh, I was just going to say you can. You're welcome to email me. This is my email address. But of course, I want live questions as well. So. I'm having a hard time understanding what you're. Well, what, yeah. what would the, what you're meaning by that? Could you say it again? What would you advise based on your experience that we have a technology stack which has commercial OS databases, mid tier and all? Have we, we have minimum open source right now? Yeah. We're looking to open source, is it much easier for us to new projects to be based on open source technology? Should we look how we can migrate our current technology to open source? Which is yeah, yeah, okay. So the question is really, I've got an existing infrastructure that's got a lot of commercial products in it, obviously. As I move forward and want to engage more around open source, what's the right way to approach that? Should I think about replacing products that I've got in my, in my infrastructure, my stack, or should I look at you know, adding to around it? What I'd say is that, you know, that it's, it, there's not a single answer that says do this or do that. It depends on the circumstances I focus a lot on the ROI. And if you take a look at that um, webcast I talked about, it really focuses on exactly those issues. Where do you get the best ROI in terms of making your product selections? And you know, in what, what we term familiar versus unfamiliar or familiar versus familiar. Familiar being we've already got it, we've already got the skills built up, you know, so forth. Unfamiliar is it's new stuff. So you know, let me just use an example. Um, an organization I know had uh, BEA WebLogic in there in its or, in its stack, right? So it's a J2EE standards-based product. They need to upgrade to a later version of J2EE, in other words, the standard. So they said, "What should we do?" Well, they they you know the BEA guy came in and said, "We'd love for you to upgrade. You know, here's the invoice. It'll be half a million dollars." They weren't a very big organization, so they actually did a bake-off between that and JBoss, which is also a J2EE-based app server, they found there was tremendous payoff for them. Instead of uh, half a million dollars, it was going to be $50,000. So they were able to do that. But they had, that was a very attractive thing because it was, they already had the skill set built in for JBoss, so there wasn't much of a transition cost for them. Whereas the classic of, should I rip out Windows and put in Linux, that's the hardest. Because you've got all the skill set built up around Windows, all your people know how to use it, and if you rip it out and bring in Linux, then you're going to pay the price all up front to get your get your skill base built. So it depends on the situation, um, you know. And I think you need to look at individual choices. Generally speaking, most organizations are loath to take out something that's already working and replace it with something that's significantly different. And that makes sense from a skill, from a cost, from a so forth perspective. <coughs> 
So in those cases, uh, you know, what we say is it's the surround and extend. So for example, with Windows and Linux, a very common strategy is I'm going to leave all my Windows servers in, running my apps and so forth, but I'm going to bring in a Linux box and start having it do file and print sharing. So then I pay, I, I have to increase my skills a little bit. I have to make some investment in skill, but I don't have to train everybody day one. So that might be a good strategy for you. All right, other questions? Okay, well, so this is a place where you are welcome to contact me and I'd welcome it and I'll be around the conference the rest of the day and tomorrow.